We're already more than a month into 2023 and it's looking like it's going to be a really significant year in terms of payments. So what are the big changes going to be? And maybe more importantly, what might take us by surprise? That's what we're going to explore in this episode of Navigating Digital Payments. Welcome to the Navigating Digital Payments podcast, brought to you by Worldline, bringing you the latest innovations, trends and predictions about the future of payments. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Navigating Digital Payments podcast. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm David Daly. I look after the Discovery Hub here at Worldline and I'm really thrilled today to be joined by two fantastic guests. First up, we've got Rick Kuckelbergs, who is the founder and managing director of the banking scene, also the founder of the Innovation in Payments LinkedIn group, and regular host on the FinTech Uncut podcast. Rick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Great to have you with us. And we have a returning regular guest, Ina Kostiuk, who is the global partner manager for the merchant services part of the Worldline business. Ina, great to have you with us again for this episode of Navigating Digital Payments. Hello, gentlemen. Always a pleasure. Super. So we're looking ahead to what's going to happen to payments in this year. And at the end, I'd really like to get both your views on what you think might be the most surprising or unexpected change that we're going to see. Um, but I thought maybe before we come on to that, it would actually be good to start by reflecting on last year, on 2022. So, Rick, maybe I'll start with you. Looking back at 2022, what do you think was maybe one or two of the most important shifts that we started to see in the payments world? Well, I think indeed, if you want to talk about uh, 2023, the first thing you need to do is make an evaluation of what just happened, because that's what will shape the future. Um, and when you look at 2022, I gave another thought during the weekend, and I think the, the debate on cross-border instant payments got a lot stronger this year. Um, also with the additional mandate from the uh, European Commission. And we'll discuss about that later in this session. And I think another one, a very important one, is the, the crackdown of stable coins. Uh, we saw all the um, fraud and, and, and also the, 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 the several disasters in the crypto space and stable coin business. And on the other side, the further development of CBDCs all across the world, which was for me also Discussions start already much sooner, but became more concrete during 2022. Another topic from the past 10 years that got much stronger this year is, is open banking um, and much more creativity that happened in the open banking space as banks got more mature APIs across Europe and people started using them for the better reasons as well. And then, of course, the final countdown to ISO 222, perhaps less relevant for this podcast, but yet I think very important one when you talk about payments, especially across banking, but also from banking to corporates, etc., as it will enrich a lot of the messaging. It was a big thing in 2022 until it got delayed to 2023. So that's definitely something that will come up in 2023. Um, and then when you talk about consumer behavior, I think... One of the things worth mentioning is also that after COVID, we got back to normal. It was a new normal, but you also saw that the, the shifts in behavior, the massive shifts that happened during COVID, slightly diminished also post-COVID and that people started, not everyone, there was a lot of uptake on digital payments, of course, but there was also part of the population that, that went back to behavior they had before in a way. So um, I think all these elements were for me the things that, that shaped 2022. And I guess there's two interesting things I notice in, in your answer, Rick. Firstly, as you say, it's, it's not always that something drastically new comes out, but it, it can be that an existing topic reaches a new significance or a certain inflection point. And I just, CBDCs that you mentioned, central bank digital currencies, is a good example of that, I think. When we were writing about that in the 2021 edition of Navigating Digital Payments, it still seemed like a this might happen topic, whereas I think now it feels much more like a will happen 
And the questions are more around what will the uptake be? How will it be done? How will it look like as well? If you see discussions today, it will not be programmable money until recently we always thought it will be a way for central banks to also shape the behavior of people. Some of these elements, the discussion will continue, of course, coming months and years. Um, CBDC will not be there tomorrow. That's for sure. Um, I'm very keen to see how that will change payments behavior across across Europe, across the world. And the other thing you mentioned was how things have changed post-COVID, because we had an episode of the, the podcast with Professor Leo van Hove, and he was saying there was a certain stickiness to the change in behavior. So it's not that everyone went back to exactly how they went before, but there was still a shift back in different you know, societal groups. Mm. Um, so it, it wasn't as simple as everything stayed exactly in terms of payments as it had been during the yeah. pandemic. So I think it's it's interesting, as I say, to reflect on those changes in, in 2022. Are there any um, changes that you think happened in 2022 that were perhaps surprising or that the industry wasn't expecting so much? I think one less surprising that uh, some people have predicted for years um, but might be surprising for the fintech industry in general is the rise in the beginning but to a certain extent also the fall of buy now pay later throughout the year as the economic situation in Europe but also in the world globally changed with um, rising interest rates. The business model of buy now pay later need to be reevaluated. As a consequence, many of these companies went down, um, especially by the end of 2022. Another thing is um, I organize virtual roundtables every week on anything related to payments and banking. And back in September, we had a session on, it was on open banking, I think, and discussion around PSD3 and whether we should start talking about it, etc. And for the first time, I heard a new acronym, SPA, S-P-A-A, the SEPA Payment Account Access Scheme, which was for me a very interesting novelty that we should definitely follow up throughout 2023 as well. Um, that could well be the start of um, a whole set of APIs that will go for towards premium, where banks can also start making revenue from the as the two platform that they built throughout the past years. So that was for me a very surprising thing to hear. Um, didn't expect that to come. If I, if I can add on a SPA uh, scheme, I also truly believe it's a new upcoming opportunity for banks uh, to finally leverage and monetize the PSD2 platforms. And uh, I also see it's a way to have a broader collaboration between incumbent banks and uh, kind of a fintech and startup and payment industry in general. So where the, there is through one API or through easy, simple connection, the, uh, everyone could benefit of the seamless flows. Uh, it could be transaction in our case in terms of uh, merchant payments or it could be just passed through the information so i i completely agree and i see that um, is the next way of uh, uh, changes it's an interesting point you know you raised there but rick if i understand well what you were saying about spa it's it's really that it opens up the opportunity to monetize sh sharing the access to accounts f on the bank side is that right yeah agree and um, yeah I still need to have the session um, on more details regarding to spa to get a better understanding of what it all means uh, but essentially it's about building an account to account payment scheme that could as Ina already uh, mentioned also be very useful in the consumer to merchant payment business and Ina maybe coming on to you again still reflecting a bit on 2022 what would you say, if you had to summarize it, were kind of the main priorities that you saw amongst Worldline's customers and, and partners during that year? Um, sure. The 2022 was not uh, the easy year or year of prediction, definitely, with uh, all uh, economical crisis and many world events. Uh, it's actually become harder and harder for an, an consumer uh, to keep up with the same lifestyle. And it's as a reality we see with uh, our customer and partners. Uh, one of the main focus of merchant is actually to keep retention. 
and uh, to have an integration which will allow the end consumer to have the smooth uh, payment experience is a key. For example, Omnichannel now is here, and we recently had a session with uh, Frank about Omnichannel, and we see how relevant it is. But uh, also our internal research proves uh, that checkout point is one of the most relevant uh, point for merchant to make sure that the payment is done. And merchants actually are seeking from uh, payment companies uh, to be the main advisor to make sure that their processes are adopted the best way for the consumers. So that was the main few things what we observe and from the from merchant and from a partner's point of view. All partners are actually are looking on uh, how they can serve the changing behavior of uh, consumers and mass market demand. Uh, our partners actually notice that, uh, uh, especially for mass market, uh, the big demand is to have ability to pay everywhere, uh, anyhow, and uh, by anybody. And the alternative payment acceptance for Android device is growing significantly. And I believe it will keep growing for the next few years. So that's really interesting, you know, as you say, a shift, I guess, both for consumers and merchants with the changing kind of geopolitical and economic situation towards focus on cost, maintaining revenues, and part of that is customer retention and, and conversion. Um, so perhaps now we we shift from looking at the past to, to looking forward to the future um, and what's going to happen in 2023 so Rick maybe I come back to you what um what do you think is already on the horizon for 2023 that we can be reasonably certain about that, that we know is going to happen well the SEPA payment account access scheme um, is expected to go live on November 30 2023 so that's something where we are definitely going to see the first results this year next to that is the um, new regulation on instant payments with the mandate to also uh, combine that with a confirmation of pay. So uh, for many countries, perhaps not so much for the UK or for Netherlands, but for many others, it will be a new novelty um, in the war against fraud that people will also need to confirm whether the person they are planning to make a payment to is effectively the person they were expecting to be paying. And then, of course, we'll see a lot more concrete plans on the whole central bank digital currency agenda with the first signs already in January, um, including the message from the ECB stating that it will not be programmable money, which was a bit of a surprise for me, um, as I thought it could be an instrument, for example, to shift or accelerate the sustainable agenda, for example. Um, the fact that they're not planning to do that makes CBDC perhaps less interesting to follow but definitely um, something that we should not ignore when developing the future of payments because it is going to happen uh, question is how will it look like and how will it be rolled out and how will they make sure that there's a reasonable uptake and what i'm interested also to understand from you rick because we talked there about about spa about cbdc's obviously there's the kind of the timeline for developing these things and launching them. But then there's a separate timeline, I suppose, for when it's going to have an impact on banks, merchants, consumers. So how soon do you think we might feel those impacts? I think SPA, as I said, um, the scheme will go live November 30, 2023. So that will be relatively fast. CBDC is, of course, a lot more conceptual and um, with much more impact as well. Uh, SPA is something, it's, I mean, banks can decide whether or not they want to do that, whether they want to subscribe to, to that scheme. Case of CBDC is the central bank setting something up. I remember a chat we had in 2021, I believe, with Inge van Dijk of the, the Nederlandse Bank on CBDC. And she said back then that it's probably a life cycle of seven years before we can have any implementation for a mass audience. So when you talk about CBDC, it's good to think probably 2026, 2027, 
which is still a long time ahead of us. However, the SPA and, and the possible impact for merchants and consumers could be much faster because it's an industry initiative. It's not being mandated by a regulator or something, which has the potential to go much faster if there is a clear interest. And the fact that it comes from the European Payments uh, Council makes me believe that that is the case. So we'll see how it goes. It's always hard to... Uh, Payments, we have the chicken and the egg, um, who will be first? It's always hard to hard to bet, but I think SPA, if it if it happens, it will happen much faster. CBDC will take much longer. And it's, it's always, isn't it, there's one side is how long it takes to launch something and bring it to market. The other side is how quickly is, does the Absolutely. adoption happen? And I yeah. have in mind a little bit, for example, PIX in Brazil, where I think in two years, where it became the most commonly used digital payment means. However, a lot of that in Brazil was cash displacement. So it was people moving away from cash to to PIX. In the EU, I think, you know, the the adoption of digital payments is already much higher. So it'd be interesting with those new payment means coming up, whether we see the same shift or not. I worked at Colorado in the past. I was not in payments, but I had many discussions with them as I was in my free time managing my LinkedIn group innovation in payments. And what they said was that the rollout of new payment solutions depends on the the write-offs of the, the terminals. And if you know that a terminal takes four years before it goes end of life, you know how long it takes before you can enroll new payment solutions in a developed world. Of course, Brazil, completely different picture because they're in the middle of digitalization uh, for many merchants. But in the case of Belgium, where everyone has a terminal, it's a matter of when will they replace those terminals to ensure that there's a new terminal ready to accept new payment solutions. Although I would, I would add to that a little bit that, of course, terminals are becoming more and more um, software driven. And so sometimes they can, depends whether you need a hardware update, but if they, um, but they can be updated. And as Ina was mentioning with sort of mobile payment acceptance solutions, again, it's even more the case that sometimes those changes can be rolled out faster. But I still think that question of adoption is, um, is a really interesting one. And I also, I also believe that um, the market reality is uh, drive a lot the adoption. And in our market reality, uh, already especially big merchants, they have built all infrastructure around the existing uh, platforms, around the existing way of doing things. And it will take much longer for them to readopt a new reality. Maybe it's not four years to well, they change the terminal, but still it's not going to be as smooth as it's like three to six months. It will t- take a while, and that's what we also observe uh, as a coming trend on the market. And maybe, you know, you can elaborate a bit further on that. So thinking of those things that Rick mentioned, the instant payments, the CBDCs, and SPA, have you already seen that our customers or partners or the fintechs we work with are starting to prepare for those, have them on their, their planning? How we see it is actually they're raising questions about it. And it's get, getting a clear sign that they need more information and advice on it. So meaning that they want to understand how it will impact their business, how long it will take to adapt and what it will actually bring. Do they need that actually change? And in practical way, one of the hot topics they are all asking us now is account-to-account payment. And uh, for them, it actually is one of the basic question first to understand what is the benefits why is the need to invest so much time and efforts in order to change it and where's the change coming from so thanks for that Ina so in a moment I really want to um come back to that question I mentioned at the start about what do you think might be the most unexpected or surprising thing that comes out of 2023 um, but before before we do that I do just want to remind people that if they want to get in touch with us give us any feedback suggest topics for future episodes then you can write to us just by emailing ndp podcast at worldline.com and also a quick reminder to please take a moment to subscribe and leave us a rating and a, a review so Rick let me put you on the spot first. What do you think might happen in 2023? Maybe we're not certain, we don't know, but what might happen that could take people in, in payments by surprise? I don't know. Um, <laughs> after 
past few years, I'm not making any of those predictions anymore. But if I perhaps the realization that central bank digital currencies aren't that revolutionary, would that be a good answer to your question? Say a bit more. What do you mean by not that? Because some would say, you know, it's fundamentally changing the nature of money, for example. Yeah. Um, so what what do you mean by not that revolutionary? Well, the thing is, I don't know right now because I'm probably also one of the the people that will be surprised by the fact that it isn't that revolutionary. But if it's it starts from something very transformational, we now see that it will not be programmable money in Europe question is how much money can we have can we keep at a central bank account and to what extent will a central bank perhaps reduce that in favor of the role of commercial banks in the whole banking ecosystem there's a lot of open questions left that need to be answered um so that's where i think that i mean if i have to make a guess about the surprises that could be one but of course it's not a surprise anymore if I can already answer that question. <laughs> um, aside from that, perhaps the the phenomenon that we see more banks taking on payments again and perhaps buying a big fintech here and there that is getting in trouble and banks taking more ownership of the, the payments value chain again. And it's interesting what you say about CBDCs because I, I remember we discuss this at Worldline. And there is a view, I think, with digitization or digitalization that sometimes you kind of make a digital version of what you do today. So like a digital version of cash is not an unusual characterization of CBDCs. But sometimes you say actually the point of digitization is that it allows you to do something you could never do before. And I mean, I guess, simple example, Netflix, you know, it in the time of DVDs, it was literally impossible to choose a movie and be watching it five seconds later, you know, you clearly you could, I mean, Netflix started mailing out DVDs, but you know, it, the the real takeoff became when they digitized because that allowed something completely new. And I guess that's the the question mark. If, if CBDCs become a digital replacement for cash, maybe in some ways it's not so revolutionary, but as you say, there's a lot of decisions still to be taken and there might be some use cases that become possible that were not possible with cash or electronic money, you know, digital payments previously. Another question I still have is the whole challenge of digital inclusion. Cash today is also a matter of financial inclusion for the digitally excluded. If you're going to have a digital euro, how are you going to onboard those people that are not digitally connected just yet? And also, if I may have a shameless pitch, um, if you scroll back in your podcast history, there are a few episodes of um, Navigating Digital Payments where we talked about this financial inclusion topic. And I think, Rick, particularly relevant with you know, CBDCs is that clearly the more people adopt digital solutions, the more excluded the people who are not able to or who are unwilling to adopt them become. So it kind of, it's tempting to think, oh, as long as there's still cash, it doesn't matter. But actually, Clearly, if 99.999% of people are no longer using cash, then actually who's left becomes more excluded than they were if 10% or 20% of people were using cash. So now I also want to put Ina on the spot. So from your side, Ina, if you had a a prediction or an idea of what um, what might happen in 2023 in payments that we're not necessarily expecting, that people might not be so prepared for. I would be talking uh, from the perspective of merchant and partners with whom I work the most. Knowing how busy they are with day, the day-to-day -day life, they sometimes could miss the trends which our consumers are changing and consumers' behaviors is changing. And uh, if they don't get that right enough, don't follow, don't adapt, they might actually see the result on, on increasing of their churn business and loss of revenue. And which kind of trend on consumer behavior I'm talking, it's more about uh, raising of social commerce. And the fact that now is coming shift between B2C sales towards C2C sales. And uh, bring, coming in like alternative commerce, 
where the live shopping coming from the real stream, autonomous, autonomous stores and uh, platforms selling or metaverse. Uh, basically, it's a way that uh, retails interact with consumers is changing. We also need to understand which kind of trend provokes the changes and behaviors of consumers. So, of course, it's a focus of an ecology. So there are more and more ecological friendly goods. There are more and more needs to have a sharing uh, opportunity like to share a car or to share a house, to share a house. Or people are not ashamed to buy secondhand clothes. Uh, there are also uh, the rays of uh, social media when there are commerce could be done almost while you're watching movies. So all, all that is actually creates this um, the shift to alternatives ways to buy uh, goods and services. And of course, it trades the new payment uh, related uh, requirements. And that where the merchant uh, have to be really watching such such demands too carefully and it's a really interesting perspective you bring Ina because I think of course on navigating digital payments we often come from the payments point of view and what's changing in payments but of course for a retailer what's also matters is these shifts in consumer behavior how they want to shop and then quite often you find there are some payment related specific needs that are required so Omnichannel is a simple example, but where, of course, you want to be able to refund on online for something bought in store or refund in store for something bought online. So it kind of it all has to be connected. But again, all these or well, shifts, as you say, to C2C or to um, rental models instead of um, ownership models, all of them have some some specifics in terms of how the payments are processed, which are not coming from the payments world or from uh, new regulations or new ways of you know new schemes, but they're being driven by how consumers um want to do their shopping so it's a really good point um so i i guess it, i mean this has been quite um a dense discussion i would say we've, it feels like we've covered a lot of ground i think it was very interesting to hear the reflections on 2022 and i think when we then look at how the, the sort of predictions you've made for 2023 rick and ina um it's interesting that some of those are really a a continuation, I suppose, or an evolution of what we saw in, in 2020, 2022. And I think, I guess, in in summary, it's those things you mentioned, SPAA, it's CBDCs generally, but also the digital euro specifically, and those changes around instant payments. Um, and then the reality is no one knows what the f- what the future holds and it, what unexpected changes might arise. But as you said, Rick, there's still a lot of uncertainty, I suppose, about exactly what the impact of CBTCs will be. And it's going to vary as well um, from region to region. And as, and as you said, Ina, one of the important shifts that maybe not everyone is aware of is that change in how people want to consume and what that means for the payments side of things. And so that just leaves me to thank you both uh, for joining the Navigating Digital Payments podcast for this fascinating discussion. Rick, thank you very much. Thank you, and see you again next year for the evaluation. (laughs) Yes, we can look back in uh, in 2024 at uh, how correct or not our predictions were. That'd be great. It's a date. And Ina, thank you again for joining us. It's always uh, super to have you on board. Always a pleasure to have an interesting discussion with you. Thank you, guys. And that just leaves me finally to thank you, our dear listeners, for joining us again for this episode of Navigating Digital Payments. Thank you for listening to the Navigating Digital Payments podcast, brought to you by Worldline. Join us next time to learn more about the latest innovations, trends and predictions for the future of payments.